That was back in my logging days. Now I'm just trimming up my hand. All those little hair roots, that just allows our soil not to be adversely affected um, by our copious amount of rainfall we get here in western Kentucky. I don't know what are we doing. <laughs> I think we're about to ride over and uh, we got a fence row coming out today. We're going to see what the Traco guys are doing. No wonder she's your ex-girlfriend. <laughs> um, so we are, we're fastly approaching when we normally seed soybeans and corn and uh, the weather's still a little wonky here in our geography. Um, usually it's Easter that lines our weather out. Post Easter the Temperatures will moderate, will begin to warm up, and our, our weather is just a lot more predictable. Before Easter here, we can still, we're pretty susceptible to freezes and um, huge fluctuations in temperature. So Easter is early this year, uh, which means um, probably in the next few days the planters are going to get started. I think maybe sometime this week uh, the bean planters will begin to be in the fields and uh, we'll start to plant a few beans just to make sure the planters are going to do like we want them to do and we're not scrambling around when when the perfect dates are here when our seeding time you know like when we get inside those perfect windows which like in our geography is usually about uh, third or fourth day of April to about the 18th we want to get the most we can planted in that window for soybeans and so we don't want to come into those dates with a half uh, working planner. So this week probably is going to be making sure those planters are dialed in and ready to go. And then the corn uh, in our area, um, there will be people that start maybe this week or next week um, planting corn. Uh, and you know we can plant here from the very first couple of days of April all the way out till uh, the very first week of June. Uh, so you know it depends on every op every operation is different. Uh, we usually try to start, you know, somewhere around the 10th of April, and um, and we'll just plant uh, uh, some fields every week all the way out to the last week of May. Try to have it wrapped up by the last week of May. So uh, that's the plan for again this year. No, no corn this week. It'll be all soybeans this week. Tell them what you're doing. I'm. Sawing logs. I'm trying to cut some stuff where you can put it. Hold on, wait till you're clipped up here. Oh, you need to put one on him too. <laughs> you're coming next. I've got too much cussing. We're cleaning out the fence row. Trying to uh, get where Neil uses a big planter and just go end to end. <laughs> For sure. So, no, I'd say at least uh, 100, 100 years probably. 100 years. Can you undo this? Yeah. That's terrible. You cutting down trees? Huh? You cut, running the chainsaw? Yeah, but I've got cut some logs up there. I'm just cutting the good ones out, trying to. Kenny's my uh, man gets my saw out of the pinch. Just right. <clears throat> you get, you're gonna get tired waiting on me. What tree you, what, you cut this log out? Yeah, what is that, Neil? Not a cottonwood, is it? Kenny didn't know either. I used to be a, my old days, I used to be a logger, my high school days. I had a, logger? yeah, really? we got out of school already to go cut logs. Now I had a friend, you remember Doug? Yeah. Uh, well his, his mother had some timber. 
and she's, she gave it to him and me. He said, y'all can have what y'all can cut out of there. So she even bought him a chainsaw. Dad had an old two-ton truck. We went to work as loggers. One day we had a tree, maybe that side, big, big sucker. And we had a D-17 Alice Chamber with a front end load. Of course, it wouldn't pick it up. But, so we had the bright idea. We would, the old road bed was about this high, pull up in there and laid two logs, on, rolled that off on that truck and put two small logs beside it and went to the mill was at West Faco. It was Smith's Lumber. I never will forget it. And uh, pulled up there. He said, you boys been logging? Yeah. He stuck a, a great big old uh, cat loader, forks on that thing. He said, my God, how'd y'all load that log? <laughs> We're about to turn the truck over and done it, but we got to load it. But his back wheels came off the ground. So that's, that was back in my logging days. Now I'm just a trivet man. So everybody hates to lose trees, and so do we here, but um, the farm equipment's huge now, and uh, we're looking to just make longer runs with the farm equipment. So, um, like for instance, we have both these farms, and uh, the Fentro has been splitting them for years, and as we get to them with the track hoe, and as we have time, we clean them out, and it does open the country up. Um, not as scenic, but it does make it easier for the farm equipment to um, just be able to make longer passes and, uh, and less turnaround time, which is critical anymore because it costs so much to run this stuff. So we want to turn around the least amount possible. We turn around already a lot in Kentucky and anytime we can take advantage of uh, have two adjoining fields and make really long runs, we're looking to do it. So nobody wants to see these great big old uh, monarchs go down, but it's just part of progress. Sad part. Um, this one we're standing on here is was probably bought, I, I'm guessing, uh, late 80s. And uh, this other one over here um, has been in, around our farm a long time. It was in uh, the tenure program um, for a couple of different sign-up periods. And then uh, you know, as the, I guess in the mid 90s when commodities really started to pick up steam, um, it came out of the 10 year program for the last time, We, you know, and it's been in production ever since. So probably nearly 30 years of production on this place. And and this one had never been in, in any kind of program. It's always just been a, a farmed uh, field for grain production. All right, so we're at this is a this last year was a rye field production rye, and uh, after we cut the rye, um, we put it back into another rye cover. And so what we're looking at out here is um, this is very late seeded rye. So we are probably seeding into the last week of October, first week of November in this field, and you see we've got pretty good growth. Um, basically, what we're trying to do is uh, just hold our sandy silt loam in place to keep uh, erosion from happening and uh, you can see that we've got a good established root system already all those little hair roots that just allows our soil not to be adversely affected um, by our copious amount of rainfall we get here in western Kentucky and uh, it is a little unhandy to plant through in the spring like as for, it's not as, you know, it's not as easy as planting into a good clean seed bed that's been sprayed down, but we also don't have to uh, worry about our fields washing off uh, when we're getting those big heavy spring rains. So um, we'll seed this green um, and then spray it after that. And then we have the new crop coming, uh, you know, to take the place of the root covers that the rye is providing for us currently.
it's a very rangy t you know this is very much a heritage uh plant um rye has not uh for the most part there is a few hybrid ryes uh which are um you know ryes that have been taken and either crossbred with other species uh, or um you know spliced with wheat um but like this variety right here is a heritage variety so it's very much original like just like god intended it to be it's it's never been altered and it it's still um pretty lazy like it wants to it wants to get super tall and then lay down you know um and that's one of the that's one of the bad things about rise it it's uh you know, I think it was intended to be in a, like God intended it to be very sparsely growing where it could get tall and um, like use its height to shade out its competitors, you know. So when you put it in a competitive situation against other plants of rye, it wants to get super tall. And because of that, you know, like when it gets heavy grain in its head, it just wants to lay down. and which can be a problem because once rye gets down, it's hard to plant through. And it's also, uh, any of these grass species like this put a toxin in the soil to keep other plants from, other competitive plants from growing. And uh, rye is especially toxic to other plants. So like when you're planting like another grass crop, which for, like corn for instance, you know, which is one of our crops we grow here, uh, whenever you're putting corn against rye, uh, after rye's been established, you're going to get that toxin affecting the new plant a little. Um, you know, your rye is dying, so your toxin level is being reduced as the rye dies, but there's, it's still in, in present in the field. Um, so it is a challenge to seed the desired crop into a cover crop situation, and that's why you know, you see a lot of areas that haven't adopted the cover crop type system because they don't want to have to deal with those, uh, the consequences of having a cover crop. It does offer benefits, but there's a lot of consequences to go along with it. How long have you been cover cropping? We've been cover cropping, you know, like as long as I've been on this farm, we've been cover cropping, and uh, which is over, you know, 25 years now. and. You know, we've really just in the last 10 really uh, got to where we're cover cropping most everything, really the last five. Um, but we've utilized and learned about cover crops for the, for the last few decades here. Well, the, it no, most of the, like, all right, so like if a, in most of the distilleries are small batch distilleries. Um, so they are still very much in the mom and pop style. I mean, there is some big distilleries. Um, not in our region particularly, but outside of our region. Um, that, but most of them have certain farms that they're purchasing the product off of, like specific farms. Um, in our geography, if we want to market crop to a distillery, we have to clean it and small bag it into 2,000 pound bags and then hold it for when, because they can't, of course, they can't take semi loads of crop. And so distillery, uh, like distillery purchases still happen in very small amounts. And uh, it's very much uh, a niche business. Um, so like if we wanted to take this rye crop to complete maturity, it would come off somewhere around the third or fourth week of June or maybe in the, even the first week of July. Um, we would harvest the rye, have it cleaned, bagged into 2,000 pound bags, and then uh, as the distillery would need it, they would call and be like, hey, we needed a 2,000 pound bag, and you would ship them the 2,000 pound bag. Um, versus like m normal production ag, you would have the, the, the grain just in the bin from the combine and sell it you know, by the truckload to the facility. It, in in the distillery business, it's not like that yet. May not may never be like that. It's very uh, unique business where in in the ag space where they're using very small amounts of product to produce their product.
So what do you end up doing with your rye when you harvest it? Well, you harvest it? Uh, we do harvest some rye every year, and occasionally we will still, uh, sell to the distillery. Most of the time, my rye is used right back into my own farm. So we grow a heritage variety so I can save it without, um, you know, worrying about infringing on somebody's patent uh, or somebody's uh, produced uh, hybrid. So our heritage rye, will we'll clean it and it'll go back in the 2,000 pound bag and then we'll reseed it into a field, a cover crop situation like this. And a lot of times, if I sell to a distillery, it's because I can't use my product on my own place. And it, uh, you know, it's just in my, in my inventory, I have too much seed, produce more than I'm gonna use. And if I can't sell it to my neighboring growers, it'll wind up in the distillery and maybe in a bottle somewhere. So that's not my goal with rye. My goal with rye is to provide my own cover crop cheaply and to sell to my neighbors that also like to utilize it. But. Um, it will occasionally make it to a bottle. So if you're interested in logs, this is the valuable part of a tree. So uh, like if you're a lumber yard, if you're buying lumber or whatever, um, you're not using the whole entire tree, you're actually only using the, uh, the main trunk of the tree and you cut them in eight foot sections. Uh, most of the time that's considered a, har uh, a saleable log. So what we have here is uh, the tree is cut into sections that the mill can handle. It'll then be loaded on the trailer, taken to the mill, and they'll mill it into lumber or, or uh, whatever they're going to use it for. So this is a good example. So here you have the root stock on the tree, and then this tree made three saleable logs. You see uh, they cut the root stock off, and then there's three logs that come out of that one tree. and you know, that can be sawed into four by fours or six by sixes or two by fours or whatever the mill desires that day. All right. So this is one of our production wheat fields and it's already had all its fertilizer on. Uh, we've applied nitrogen out here twice. We applied fertilizer last fall as well. And uh, all this crop is waiting on is to be harvested. So um, we'll have one more fungicide shot that comes right around heading to make sure we don't wind up with vomitoxin, which is a, a poison that can come from too much rainfall into the grain. Uh, we prevent that with fungicides. That vomitoxins uh, poisonous to uh, any animal that consumes the grain. Um, we don't want that in the grain. Um, so we'll try to laminate that with a fungicide shot. But other than that, this field is, uh, is had all the um, passes it's gonna have for the season and it's just waiting on harvest. Uh, so we're just out here looking around in a little bit, making sure we don't have any uh, aphids or undesired pest. Uh, Army worms are, and cutworms are also a threat to a wheat crop. Um, it's really not time for them yet, but we're about 22 days ahead of schedule with this crop because of our uh, extremely warm weather. Um, so it never hurts to just take a look and make sure we don't have something uh, happening in the field we don't know about. Aphids are always a, a area of concern for wheat, which is just a little tiny sap sucking bug. Uh, you don't have to have a magnifying glass to look for them, but they really are that small. Um, I haven't seen a lot of aphid pressure this year, but there is a few uh, here and there. So, but we'll just keep an eye on it to make sure that we don't have an aphid problem. If if you do, you know, get some aphids where uh, they're above the threshold, you have to spray an insecticide to get rid of them. We don't like insecticides. We try to stray away, never use them unless we have to. Um, so we'll live with a few aphids, uh, but if they get above the threshold, you just have to use it. Uh, so a couple of days ago here, we had a frost event happen, and the wheat is pretty late in its process to get a frost event. Um, you can see that it's damaged some of the leaves a little bit. We won't know if it damaged our grain any really until harvest. Uh, it's just one of those things with wheat. Um, you know, you can have a, a freeze that's hard enough to totally kill the plant, 
in this geography it doesn't happen very often. A lot of time our freeze events are just enough that it gives the wheat a slight amount of damage, uh, kind of cut your yield a little bit, but not enough to lose the crop. So more than likely we did lose, we did get a haircut on our bush yield a little bit with the frost, but probably not enough to uh, just totally adversely affect it. So just part of living and growing wheat. Okay, bye. So here we go. We're almost at a high quality production level for audio. This is our new podcast studio Clayton and I are working on. Um, it's just out here at my house in, a, in an old out building that uh, is now being repurposed into a podcast studio. So bathroom, this will be our lounge area. Um, we're gonna have a TV here on this wall. Here in this room will be our control room slash office um, where we'll have our soundboard and stuff and then we'll actually have a high quality sound and audio uh, from our actual studio so we'll have a desk here cameras and uh, and be able to provide a good high quality sound for you guys so it doesn't sound like we're making our podcast out of a cracker jack box <laughs> so yeah we're excited um Clayton says, when are we going to be done with this podcast studio? So this week, hopefully, we'll have insulation. Um, I, I expect in six weeks to be finished with this project, I hope. So it's about 600 square feet in our studio in, in all uh, from the time we come in the door to the very back. And uh, all our wiring's done. Um, and we're all framed in. All we need now is some insulation and sheetrock and some trim and we'll be complete. So we're gonna go out here and talk to Dottie for a minute. She's my favorite chicken. We've done some seeding of the garden so far. We've got a couple different types of lettuce that are, uh, they weather the freeze pretty good. This is romaine over here. And then uh, this is like, I don't know, that butter, whatever it's called. One my wife likes. So uh, the lettuces fared, did pretty well against the freeze. You can see where the cabbage uh, and the cilantro there didn't like the freeze. It hammered it. Hold on, Dottie. Why are you running from me today? She didn't want to be picked up. Dottie. I'm not gonna chase her around that much. She does not want to be picked up today. Look at the spurs on that guy. Not saying you should. This is Nosy. She's my oldest chicken in the flock. She doesn't really like to be picked up, but she's been a decent sport. She's what started my chicken flock, really. We just let them free range and gather their eggs and just use them here on our own farm. See, this chicken here is in moat. See how it has its uh, plumage all roughed up? Yeah. They molt off uh, about once a season and their feathers will look terrible for a little while and then they'll come back in and they'll be beautiful. Dottie. I don't know what you, we were out here picking her up yesterday. I don't know why she wants to be, doesn't want to be messed with today. That's a Jersey giant right there, the big black guy. Yeah, You want to get the little mini chickens? Yeah, good for the YouTube. <laughs> That's our first two uh, chicks this spring right here. We very much just let them free range and uh, 
you know, most a lot of these chickens have came from from just like this. They just raise their own, and uh, every now and then we'll lose some to a hawk or a coyote or a fox. But we get enough new life that it keeps us, the flock established. So they love to come out. Like when we're working in the garden, they'll come out and you know follow us out there and. Thanks for watching our YouTube this week. Like, share, and subscribe.